But I think the most important trend and, and why I actually was excited to get on the podcast today is purpose-built community products were needed yesterday. Like they are so needed in this marketplace. You know, like we utilize different tools for our community, um, but they're not all built with community in mind, right? We've kind of hacked them together to do what we need them to do. And that has to change for this space. Like there has to be community built products. And I think what's so interesting, Joel, is like, you know, the pricing model plays more of a role in community built products than it does with software. Like I got a quote for something the other day. It was $860,000 um, for my community. And I was like, how do you expect me to pay this for my free community? Right. And they're like, well, and I was like, this conversation's done, right? Like you have to understand who, who we are. We, we articulate this to you. And what, that's one product. How am I supposed to have five or six products in my system, right? So, uh, or in my ecosystem. So community built products need to exist. Uh, pricing models need to exist with them. And these products need to help solve these challenges. Hey everyone, I'm Joel Primack, host of the Community Leg Growth Show. Today I'm joined by James Kakis, co-founder of P Sales Collective. Thank you so much for being on the show today, James. Hey, Joel, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, it's really a privilege to talk to you and be on today's episode. Why, thank you. Privilege is all ours. Um, so let's dive in with a quick question to give all of our listeners a little brief overview about yourself. So would you please give everyone that overview? Yeah. So as mentioned, I'm the co-founder of the Pre-Sales Collective. Uh, also co-founder of a company that we call Pre-Sales Academy, which is a reskilling boot camp uh, that works alongside Pre-Sales Collective. Prior to uh, being a full-time founder, I was a solutions engineering leader at Salesforce. And prior to that, I was the first solutions engineer at a company called Showpad. And so I've been working in this startup space, this technology space for quite some time. Uh, this pre-sales role, solutions engineering, whatever you may know it has, has been something that I'm very passionate about for years. And, you know, even prior to technology, I worked in uh, hospitality and I worked in operations and I learned a lot about customer experience and how things work. And I really utilized that experience uh, in those different industries to create a career in technology and now community. Wonderful. So diving into that, as you mentioned, yeah. you have built up pre-sales collective as a global community for pre-sales professionals so mm -hmm. what was the moment that you realized that there needed to be a space for those people to come together yeah, yeah. you know i have to take a little bit of a step back to, to answer that question so uh when i was in san francisco i worked for a hospitality group and i transitioned to a tech company and i was a customer engagement manager and in those meetings and in those calls I would help onboard people, but because I knew hospitality so well, I would join the pre-sales calls to help talk to different hotels about how our technology worked. I became a subject matter expert very easily. And I was like, wow, selling is a lot more fun than actually doing the implementation. This is a career that I want to get into. Uh, the thing was, is that I was kind of learning on the fly. And being in San Francisco, this amazing tech community, there was this thing called the San Francisco Sales Engineering Meetup. And I showed up to one event once, Joel, and there was over 100 sales engineers there. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I didn't even know this job existed. And so I would just network and meet people and get to know them. And then that's how I built my team and my strategy is that I would call up people at Box or Optimizely or Salesforce and be like, hey, how are you doing this? How are you doing that? And that's how I built my own career. And when I moved to Chicago uh, temporarily, um, now here four years later, um, I decided I decided to start a local group in Chicago and wanted to help build this ecosystem and community because again, I'm so passionate about this role. I think it's the best job no one's ever heard of. And there just continues to be no resources for it. And when I was at Showpad in Chicago, I was introduced to my co-founder, Yuji Higashi who was at outreach and he's in seattle and he started a group in seattle and we would call each other every month every couple months and say hey how are you doing this how are you doing that and we asked ourselves if you're not in a couple of cities san francisco seattle um chicago new york had a group how were you meeting people in this profession outside of your own company 
And the answer was, you didn't. You didn't. It just didn't happen. And so what we decided to do was to either create our the first sales engineering conference and or create a community around it. We chose to do the community so that we'd have momentum for the conference. And we're planning to launch this in May or June of 2020. All of a sudden, pandemic happened, March, um, and my Chicago event that was supposed to be in person, a big event, went virtual. And I saw 250 people in one week sign up for this virtual event, and none of them were first from, from Chicago. And so I said, called Eugene and said, hey, we're gonna start the Pre-Sales Collective today. And he's like, what? And I was like, we're starting Pre-Sales Collective. And we announced it that night, we put the website up, and things have just accelerated since. And I think, you know, this profession, we used to say is the forgotten function there you know everyone knows that you need sales engineers solutions consultants um but they always don't get the resources that they need within an organization and i think creating that ecosystem uh, was very important for us and the fact that people lost the ability to go into the comp go into their offices they were just looking for belonging and we really wanted to create a community with two-way relationships and really fill that void and and that was the moment and the accelerator that happened to, to bring us to Pre-Sales Collective today. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us today. Now, as you mentioned, Pre-Sales Collective has grown exponentially over the last two years or so. It's grown to 18,500 plus members, continues to grow daily. So what are the three most impactful ways y'all have grown the community? Yeah, it's been it's been a really unbelievable journey, right? Watching this community grow, you know, and, and something that's really wild about those numbers is that we don't really do outbound. Everything has been inbound to our community. But for us, we really, you know, it's our mission. Let me let me start by answering this question with our mission is to really to elevate the role of pre-sales and organizations worldwide. And we provide, you know, pre-sales professionals with resources, knowledge, network, mentorship to develop long and impactful careers. And we do that through our values, right? So we serve as a catalyst for change, cultivate community through belonging, support personal and professional growth, and advocate equal opportunity for all. That is so pillar to what we do that we really want our mission, our vision, our values to really come in, you know, you know, really be part of everyone's DNA, right? When you come to this community, you understand that, you feel that. And if I had to break that down into three, three aspects. The biggest thing from my perspective is probably the consistency. It is really hard to create a podcast every week, to have a blog article run every week, to create a thriving Slack community, to have webinars of high quality. And we put, our, put ourselves in an uncomfortable position by putting a lot out there, but we have been consistent every single week. We have never really missed anything. So, so the community then understands that there's predictability, right? We're consistent, it's predictable, people know what's coming. The second aspect of that is execution. We believe that you must execute at a very high level. We try to put high quality into all of our events, into all of our mediums. We understand that there's sometimes that that may not happen and we have room for failure, but we've created a really repeatable structure and process to how we execute that allows us to do a little bit more um, with less, uh, with a small team. And then I think it's the voice. You know, I mentioned like we start with the forgotten function and creating these resources for this underserved, underappreciated, uh, sometimes overutilized profession. And we've really stuck to our brand as well. It's it's very important for us um, to keep our brand consistent, to make sure that we're not giving our brand to anybody else, and really staying front and center with pre-sale professionals. And I do think it is worth noting that we really do believe in empowering our community. You know, there are so many people that are doing amazing work um you know in the profession in the day-to-day -day. and so we want to highlight them as hosts and webinar uh guests or podcast guests and you know those are the people that are, are are again in the trenches they're doing the amazing work and we've created a platform to highlight them and i think that is is worth highlighting as as part of those three key items awesome thank you so much that's great to hear and i love how there's an element of kind of the consistency point one ties into the voice of like giving your people a voice through those consistent channels, whether it's blogs, events, podcasts, et cetera. So they kind of feed each other. I think that that was, that's really cool. Yeah. Very smart. Yeah, and Joel, I, I appreciate it. You know, one thing I want to highlight, Joel, is that 
we've never wanted to make sure it was the James or UG show, right? Like just because we started this community, if you actually look at like the events, the podcast is the only thing that I have that I'm consistently on. I used to run all the webinars. I don't run any webinars anymore, right? I work behind the scenes. Um, you know, I, I don't, you want to come to the Pre-Sales Collective and read all of my thoughts on all of my blogs, right? We want to highlight the people in this profession. And so I think that's been really important from us uh, and UG as well. You know, UG runs really the day-to-day -day on Pre-Sales Academy. So we like to be behind the scenes and allow our community members to be front and center. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's definitely, I think, like a great point of view to have as you approach building out the media of the community. I think yep. that that's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So now we've kind of talked a little bit about the growth of the community, how it's grown. Mm -hmm. I want to dive into this other piece of the pie of Pre-Sales Collective is a true, per se, community. It's yeah. not owned by any other organization. So at what point did you guys decide to now monetize the community by having partnerships with companies? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I have a role that you're I'm only allowed to take good question when I'm, you know, pre-sales engineers, sometimes when you're on a call, you say that a lot of times, but this philosophy around paid community is a very intense debate, I think in the community space. And I have a very uh, specific point of view on this that I know some people agree with and some disagree. I firmly believe in free community. I understand that when things are free, you may or may not get the level of engagement of if you paid for something, right? If you pay for something, you feel a little bit more obligated. But because of this profession and because it has been under-resourced for so long, we from day one wanted a free community and we plan to, to keep a free mechanism of our community forever. I, I wanna call it free forever and I hope that we can make that happen, uh, but it's really important to us. And the, the reason being is that if we, if we keep a free community, we're lowering the barrier of entry. And if we are consistent with our content and everything is executed at a high level, it means it's producing value. And it's producing value to people who are trying to get into the profession, who are new to the profession, are veterans of the profession, individual contributor or leader. And we believe, again, that bringing down those walls, right, of, of talking to other people at other companies that are solving the same problems is, is where the innovation happens, right? It's really where that magic happens. And to do that, right, we do have to monetize in one way or another. And so by keeping the community free from really day one, we have decided that to do what we wanted to do, we're gonna have to figure out a monetization strategy. And instead of asking the people in the profession to pay for, for this role, we wanted to go to the, the companies that are, are selling to this persona to pay for the community, right? And so we do partnerships and sponsorships with companies that are building knowledge that are purpose-built for the persona. And I would say we do have one mechanism that we, we charge for for the individuals, and that is our paid leadership community. We have a private community for job leaders that don't really actually advertise. It's pretty much all inbound. Uh, and that's $50 a month or $600 a year, which is really less than an hour of two even coaching, you know, like that, we believe that we're providing tremendous value. And so we are working with a number of companies that are wanting to provide resources for their leaders because they can't do it in house. And so pre self leadership is becoming a mechanism. And while we might be, you know, charging some individuals, we are charging companies in a lot of places. And we believe it's part of the personal and professional development uh, that folks in this profession are just probably not getting on a day to day basis. And so for us, like we've kept to our monetization strategy, I will say, Joel, that I turn down money all the time. And this is going to sound really counterintuitive to what most people are thinking right now. But if I don't believe in logo splashing, it does my community no good. And it does us no good and the partner no good. If they just want to come in and say, we'll give you $1,000, $2,000 to do this. If it's not a holistic experience, you're, what value are you really going to get out of? That's a transactional relationship that I'm not interested in. If you're going to be promoting your, your, your product to our community, we need to make sure that it's really front and center in a number of different places. And our community members 
actually can articulate that or can receive value if they were to utilize your technology. And that has allowed us to almost like a, a software sale of, of, of um, you know, move companies out of our pipeline. Be like, hey, you know what? You're just not a fit for, our, and your revenue is great and it'll help us grow. But we always think about the members front and center. And so that's been a very important aspect of what we do. And I know that when I tell people that, they're like, what? Do you really do that? And I do. We do it all the time uh, because it's very important to maintain a good member experience across this growth that we're having. See, I'll say, I think that that makes a lot of sense because there's the balance is what you're really talking about. There's a balance of, of yeah. course, driving revenue for the organization to then feed all these great benefits to members through these company partnerships. But then there's the other balance of members still have to get value from the partnership. It can't just be right. an ad per se or yeah. flying yeah. by billboard. Um, that's not valuable. I mean, just Joel, drive down your street. That's such a great point. <laughs> You're right. That's such a great point. And like, that's why we have actually, I don't want to say fired or, you know, we've decided to break ways with some partners is because if, you know, we're going to do something together and there's not intention behind your outreach or your messaging, we've had some partners just like throw people into some random campaigns that don't speak to our persona at all. So guess what? All those members come back to us at Pre-Sales Collective and say, why did this company send me this? You know, and they, that actually ends up being a reflection on us and we have to balance ourselves. Is it worth bringing in that revenue or not? And I think a lot of our community understands that like we will be partnering with, you know, sponsors and providing email lists and different opportunities for them to get engaged with you because it maintains this free community. And I think we've built a lot of trust with our community that allows us to do that. And as long as we want to keep free forever, this is the monetization angle and perspective we, we need to have. Yeah, I definitely can follow along like that path of reason for that process. And I think that many more communities in the future, both kind of true or peer communities, such as pre-sales collective or ones that are company owned, um, are going to follow suit, I would imagine. So diving into this a little bit deeper, I'm curious, did you guys have any hesitations about monetizing the community? And if so, how did you overcome those? Yeah, I think it was around the leadership collective. And from our perspective, we believe $50 a month or $600 a year, as mentioned, was a very low amount of money compared to coaching or tr two day training, right? It's a, and if you actually look at like the market comps, right? About what is actually compared to leadership groups, some of them are thousands and thousands and even tens of thousands of dollars per year, right? So we want to balance that. You know, we we did feel that we wanted to keep costs low, but have a small barrier of entry that would allow the folks who want to put more energy into this to put their energy into this. And this kind of goes to that conversation or that comment I made earlier about paying for something versus getting something for free. And, you know, we want to find that right balance. And so, yes, we were hesitant about that. We just started our leadership community uh, a little over a year ago. So, you know, it, it took us a year of just purely free before we did a, a paid model. Uh, but we, we do believe in the actual investment and the value that we're providing and the value uh, per, for the cost, in our opinion, uh, absolutely outweighs uh, what we're doing. And so it... it it's an important aspect of our business moving forward and how we continue to grow it. And, but it did, it did have a lot of conversation behind the scenes of like, should we do this or should we not do this? Cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. Cause I'm always curious about how companies or communities or organizations kind of grapple with that, like little tug yeah. of war in their head. Yeah. yeah. So we've now kind of talked about, some of the growth of the community we've talked about how you guys have partners now to fund these activities for the community so now as a result of that you may or may not be building a community roadmap and how does the team actually go about doing so when there needs to kind of be that next member benefit or perk yeah yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer beyond the community drives our roadmap, right? Like we as a good community need to listen to our members. 
uh, and to understand like what's happening in the market as well, right? Like, is it just noise? Are they trends? Are they absolutely needs? And I think this, this interesting premise that I've come to recently and bear with me on this example, but if you were, do you have a favorite band? Uh, yeah, I love Green Day. Okay, Green Day, right? So if Green Day was coming to town and uh, you would maybe go, you know, go see them, right? For us, you know, we were, we'd be at the Green Day concert with you and we would ask you uh, a survey and we'd ask you why you decided to come to the Green Day concert, you know, why they're your favorite band. And we're asking you all these questions. But you're the type of person who is going to buy tickets, show up to the show and engage in that concert. What happens to all of those people who like Green, ba Green Day, but aren't buying concert tickets, right? Are passive observers. How do we get their feedback as to understand why Green Bay is their favorite and why or why not they didn't go to the concert? And that is what I think is a very, and it might be a stretch, right? But that is the example of getting feedback from the community. Are you getting feedback from your most engaged members who are, you know, live and die by the pre-sales collective who love everything that we do? Or are we getting feedback from the people that are on the periphery that have engaged a little bit or here and there? And we're trying to bridge that gap, right? So a lot of what we do is the community and, and is is the trends. And I do joke that I'm in pre-sales La La Land. Like my job now is not actually in the role. I talk to people who are in the role every single day, all over the world, individual contributors, frontline leaders, executives with one, two, three, four thousand person organizations. And so getting their purviews is very interesting and trying to disseminate between that about what actually matters to the community is really important for us. And so, you know, that's really how we drive a lot of what we do. But I will say, you know, last year was a lot of like go as wide as possible, be everything pre-sales. And we got a lot of great feedback. And this year is a lot more about tailoring uh, the experience. And I've been calling it re-architecting our member experience. You know, we have a new website launching. We have a member hub, a member portal for anybody who's in pre-sales collective, uh, an elevated Slack experience. Like we're doing some really cool things on the technology side uh, because we now have a seven person team to do so. And so really the roadmap is driven by the community. Uh, but it's balanced with us, right? Like as we're in this like purview of hearing from all these people uh, and understanding what works and what doesn't work, how do we find the balance of that? Because I think the worst thing to do is to operate in an ivory tower where it's like, hey, this is our community. We we are, this is our nine to five. We do this every single day. We know what matters, but if we're surveying the wrong people, we're hearing feedback from, from just a, a targeted group, are we appealing to the masses? And I think it's a really hard thing to do, Joel. I think scaling communities is way harder. Uh, maybe not it's way harder. It's it's much different than scaling a, a technology or a software platform. And so like it takes a different muscle. And most of the people that work at pre-sales collective, we come from technology. So we're flexing new muscles and we're bringing in new talent like Courtney and Shauna who come from community experience to balance out what we're doing. Awesome. And I'm going to add two notes. One, uh, Green Day has great shows. So go see Green Day. They're coming <laughs> to City near you. I've seen them twice alive and I love them. Never disappoint. Two, uh, I love think that. you hit on something really cool and interesting around this idea of like how you take feedback and then turn it into action. And I really mm -hmm. like to say that like especially negative feedback or critical feedback, whatever adjective you would like to describe to it, yeah. like it's only room for opportunities and people are telling you it because they care to some degree. And then yeah. it only allows you then to build something new and then they feel more yeah. like, connected to it because yeah. they then see that you guys took action on it. Yeah. Joel, you nailed that, right? Um, one of my first podcasts was creating a culture of feedback. I have always in my day-to-day -day career uh, built a culture of feedback where anybody can be completely honest about things, good, bad, ugly. And I think it's actually important because you nailed it. It's about progression. It's about continuous improvement. And for us, we don't want to hear, oh, everything is good. Like if things are not good, you need to tell us and you need to let us know what isn't or isn't good because we are making decisions based off what we're hearing. And um, I think that's 
you know, any leader faces that within any company in any organization, but really within the community, like we want people to give us that feedback to say, hey, like this isn't working for me so that we can understand, is that valid feedback? Is it based off a false assumption or and, and or is it something that we need to action on? So I really appreciate you bringing that up uh, because I think it's really, you know, a core premise of any community. I would definitely agree. And if it's not, it should be. It should be. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so we've covered a lot in actually yeah. the pre-sales collective community. Mm -hmm. I would love to learn more about how and kind of the why behind the launch of the pre-sales academy and yeah. how it supports the goals of pre-sales collective. Yeah. So, you know, to start this was again driven by the community and this is also driven by something that UG and I are both very passionate about um you know when I was actually at Showpad I created an associate program because I wanted to bring people from our organization in the BDR role into sales engineering I didn't want them to feel like they only had to go into sales uh UG and I had hired some non-traditional talent UG did the same and for pre-sales collective we were you know we're in this great resignation, war for talent, whatever you want to call it, right? The early days, this is last, this is last summer. Um, leaders were telling us how much trouble they were having hiring and they just couldn't fill roles. And the people that were applying to those jobs, Joel, were telling me that entry level jobs required like top tier school, 10 years experience, you know, proficiency in A, B, C, and D. And most companies are looking for, for unicorns when it comes to sales engineering anyway. And so what we felt that we could do was marry the two. How do we help companies fill these roles while also helping people get into this profession? Because it's the best job that no one's ever heard of, right? That's what we like to say. I look at myself and I always tell my story. I worked in, in sport and recreation operations before going to hotel operations, hotel tech, where I became sales engineer, and then I went to become a sales engineer at a traditional sales SaaS, sales enablement platform, and then to Salesforce. So like that is my journey. And I wanna help people, you know, have an easier time getting in the tech. You know, we, I like to say that for me, I was always trying to change my trajectory. I was trying to change my career trajectory. I was trying to get in the tech and I don't like to talk about it a lot, um, but I applied to hundreds of jobs when I was in hotels trying to get in the tech. I couldn't even get interviews. I wasn't even getting emails back. And that's a terrible experience. And it can really be a deterrent of trying to change your life or change your career. And so we want to make it easier for people. And so uh, one thing to highlight is like Pre-Sales Academy is focused on reskilling. We do still have some college folks, but we feel that a lot of big companies have college programs uh, and early development programs for folks that are still in university. But how many people, Joel, like go to school to be a engineer or an architect or designer, whatever it might be. And then they're three years into their career and they're like, this isn't for me. This isn't for me. We actually are seeing a lot of teachers come to Pre-Sales Academy because they're like, this just isn't for me. And right now there's no programs for them. Like there's no program. So we wanna actually be that program for them uh, to create opportunity and create new paths for folks. And I actually just wanna to touch on the business aspect of, of this too. You know, as we think about our revenue model, um you know free community uh paid board by sponsorships and partners like that's not a predictable revenue model like that's not predictable and if that dries up does that mean the pre-sales collective dries up and i do not want that to happen and so even while we have a paid leadership collective we couldn't necessarily pay for our employees uh with that and so pre-sales academy allows us to create a little bit more of a business model that will allow pre-sales collective to live on regardless of the you know economic situation around um we really believe in pre-sales collective and want this to be a community that will live on for a very long time and with an unpredictable revenue model um the future could be bleak especially as we continue to hire employees and so we believe pre-sales academy not only is doing a great job as it comes to changing people's lives but also allowing us to create more of a business uh, behind the community so that will allow the community to thrive regardless of what's happening in the world. Love it. Thank you so much for sharing all of that clarity with us around how one kind of impacts the other. I think that that's a really yeah. unique position because what it really 
you kind of touch on is like the stabilization pre-sales yeah. academy actually provides financially yes. to pre-sales collective which i think is yep. really interesting to learn so thank you for sure we got to pay our employees you know we can do that but you know like what happens if these companies go out of business what happens if they get mergers and acquisition and budgets close and we're building a, a revenue model and you know you know kevin has to to pay his bills he's got to put food on the table for his family so how do i make sure that we can provide for him um if something were to change no i think it makes complete sense and i i think that there's also something unique about communities of or at least what you guys are doing around kind of a diversification of revenue streams too which i think is really unique and i like it a lot mm -hmm. Giving you guys major pops for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so we've kind of talked now about pre-sales collective, talked about pre-sales academy too. So how do you guys actually measure the success of the community? Do you guys have specific metrics? Are you guys very data-driven? Or are you guys a little bit more qualitative too? Yeah, it, it, that is a tough question. And I think for us, we have so many different mediums that people are digesting. You know, we're trying to understand where people are engaging with Pre-Sales Collective and where they're finding value, right? So like our LinkedIn at the time of this recording is over 21,000. We have over 18,500 people signed up on our website. So there's a gap there. And then in Slack, we have about 9,000 people that are in Slack and then less of that that are actually active on a on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. And so how do we get all of those, those measures moving together? and aligned. And I think for us, we have really looked at member growth and member engagement as our main mechanisms. We have introduced surveys for member survey scores, and we've redone our member survey to include both pre-sales leadership collective and pre-sales collective. And we're getting that feedback right now to understand where people are finding value and what they're finding valuable. And so I will tell you, Joel, that we're a little bit behind in like where I wanna be because you know, we'll ask like, where are our events, right? Like I know our webinars and from registration and attendance perspective, where those should be. We understand how many views our podcast should get on a month, uh, how many likes we should get on LinkedIn posts. Um, but that's why we're also moving to this member hub, right? Because we can actually start tracking engagement a little bit further and understand how people are digesting pre-sales collective and where they're finding value. Um, I do, I will say, I do have a dream, um, to, to measure and operate my community with a dashboard in my inbox every single day. I mean, I have told this to, to many people, uh, is that I really believe that data and engagement data will allow us to have a better measure of our community because I think where the switch is, Joel, is right now we're measuring on community growth and month over month growth. But if you have 20,000 people in a community, 100,000 people in the community, right, but only 1,000 or 2,000 are active, like, you know, one, is that okay? But are you making the biggest impact that you can? In some communities that I've talked to who have hundreds, 100,000 plus members, they only have a small subset of people that are active at any given time, but that works for their business model, you know, and their community model and people know that they'll be there. And so for us, like we're still working on that. We're still working on the engagement, but we're getting our data aligned so that we'll be able to have that dashboard in the inbox at some point in the future to know, you know, how people are engaging, where they're engaging and really where they're finding value. Um, so it's, it's definitely a top priority, especially for the second half of this year. Awesome. That will be very exciting to see. Hopefully, you guys yeah. get your dream of a dashboard in your inbox every day. I'm, I'm waiting. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm excited for you. I'm like, I want to see what is on this dashboard now. I'm like, yeah. can you like forward it to me when you get this dream to happen? <laughs> so I want to take a peek. Yeah, um, for sure. I'll hold you to that. All right, deal. <laughs> Done. Um, so on your kind of non-traditional community building journey, kind of turning from tech to sales engineering and pre-sales role to now actually building a thriving community. What are some lessons that you've learned along the way? Ooh. I think the most important lesson kind of goes back to some of the traits that I mentioned is like consistency is everything. Um, when you're like first getting started, you're gonna have to build traction with a group, right? You're gonna have to build momentum. 
And you're not going to be able to do that with like a LinkedIn post here or a quiet Discord or a quiet Slack here. Like you really need to build consistency and almost ritual into your community. And I think that was something that we did really well from day one. And as I look back, like there's probably some things we could have tweaked in that, but like that is the, the most important aspect of this entire thing. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's like, that's probably how I would answer that. I love that idea of rituals because we hear about it on the company side yeah. of companies having rituals to bring like, to build yeah. culture, bring people together, those sorts of things. But then on the flip side, if you apply it to communities, it creates yeah. that those same those same feelings and such okay. of belonging and connection to the community. So I love that. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. You're very welcome. We're wrapping up today's episode because I know that we're coming close to time right okay. now. What are three community trends that you're most excited about in 2022 and beyond? All right, that is a tough question. That's an exciting question, though, too. Um, I'll take this in a couple of different ways. I think the first one is like, as the world goes back to normal, what role does community play in building belonging, right? Is it going to be this like, hey, we were at home uh, by ourselves, you know, or with our families in our house, not traveling. And so community played this amazing role. And then all of a sudden we're back to the office and back to traveling a little bit differently. And and community moves to the background like what role is community going to play in building belonging is like the trend i'm most focused on um and actually like the second aspect of that is is kind of like the cream of the crop rise to the top right because there are so many communities coming out right now and just i love it right i do i i think it's amazing to see this like community revolution per se happening uh but i do think that they're really hard to execute on and it's also creating noise in the market and so differentiation is critical right it's critical competition is a good thing in my opinion right you know it, it forces people to be innovative and to think about things differently and so you know the best communities are going to continue to stand out like as this you know as my first point about belonging and things going back to normal um with the birth of all these communities but I think the most important trend and, and why I actually was excited to get on the podcast today is purpose built community products were needed yesterday. Like they are so needed in this marketplace. You know, like we utilize different tools for our community, um, but they're not all built with community in mind, right? We've kind of hacked them together to do what we need them to do. And that has to change for this space. Like there has to be, community built products. And I think what's so interesting, Joel, is like, you know, the pricing model plays more of a role in community built products than it does with software. Like I got a quote for something the other day, it was $860,000 um, for my community. And I was like, how do you expect me to pay this for my free community? Right. And they're like, well, and I was like, this conversation's done right like you have to understand who who we are we we articulate this to you and what that's one product how am i supposed to have five or six products in my system right so uh or in my ecosystem so community built products need to exist uh pricing models need to exist with them and these products need to help solve these challenges like you know i think about why it's so hard is like you think about the member experience and then you think about the community manager experience like us as pre-sales collective and then you got to think about the partner and sponsor experience right like all three of those together are are very tough uh so i do think purpose-built community products are so needed and they are this next wave that i i'm super excited about uh, i do love what the charlotte team is doing um because this is something that is needed in this space and it'll be very interesting to watch uh where this product goes and other products in this space continue to go why thank you very much for your kind words around charla and i would definitely echo that of it's really interesting when you talk to people and hear how they price things it's almost <laughs> like they have never actually worked at a community or <laughs> whatever industry they're selling to yeah. it's just like yeah. go do that job for like a month yeah you'll then feel that pain right yeah, yeah. It's a good point, right? And um, I understand businesses have to operate with business, you know, their business in mind. But 
you know, if you are going to come into the community space, you have to understand how communities operate. A thousand percent agree. Well, James, thank you so much for being on the Community Leg Growth Show today. If people want to follow and or connect with you on other channels, what are the best channels and or handles for them to do so? Yeah, I appreciate that. So uh, LinkedIn is my favorite. So you can find me at LinkedIn uh, in slash James Kakis. That's K-A-I-K-I-S. Um, you can also follow the Presales Collective company slash presalescollective.com. And then I have been getting a little bit more onto Twitter, uh, a little bit more and more recently. So again, James Cake is on Twitter. Uh, you can find me, you know, if, if today's episode resonated with you, please let me know. As we talk about feedback, if there's some feedback or some questions or anything that I can be of assistance with, please reach out to me. You know, helping people is, is what this whole thing is all about. Awesome. Thank you so much and have a great day. You too, Joel. Thank you. Thank you.